So if you're wondering whether it's worth it, I would actually say that for this particular style of car, I would not recommend it to other people. G'day guys, today I'm going to be doing sound deadening on the Mazda BT50. This is an extra cab 2015 XTR model. So it's quite a lot to cover in this video and there'll be chapter marks down below if you want to skip ahead to the install. But I'm also going to be covering sound deadening materials, the different stages, stage one, stage two. I've got four different materials here. I've got sound deadener, mass noise liner, acoustic liner and insole layer. Everything I bought is from car builders. We'll run through the website as well as a physical example, just briefly looking at the differences and why you would use each one. Gonna be going through before and after testing, measuring the noise and the average noise at different speeds. I'll be covering all the trim removal. That includes the door trims on an extra cab, the roof lining, the floor pan, the rear firewall seats, the front seat removal and the center console removal. I'll really briefly go over the application and show you how much sound deadener I used. I'll do a little bit of resonance testing before and after applying sound deadening just so you can see what the sound deadening actually does. I'll be covering the weights for each different material so how much weight is added in sound deadener compared to mass noise liner compared to acoustic liner and so on and so forth. Going through all the costs and looking at where you might be able to save money on your install. So this is something I've been really reluctant to do because wherever possible, I want to avoid adding weight to the car. And this whole process adds a lot of weight to the car. So there's a lot of work involved in it and a lot of weight added. And I'm not 100% sure that I'm going to see massive benefits. Now the reason for this is, and I don't know, but this is an XTR model. And I have a feeling that the high spec models get more noise cancelling and uh, mass noise liner from factory than the lower spec models. So I can show you this, if we just have a quick look at the brochure. 2016 BT50 brochure. And where this is handy is that it comes with all the specs that we need. So if we look at the four x four models and you compare a dual cab XTR to a GT to an XT. XT being the lower spec, GT being the highest. We have the curb weights here. So you see the difference between a dual cab XT and a dual cab XTR is about 69 kilograms there. And then there's another 13 kilograms between the GT and the XTR. So what I'm thinking without having any proof, I would need a XT to be stripped apart so I could see. But I feel like a lot of this weight comes from improved cab uh, MVH levels, noise vibration harshness in the way of mass noise liner or extra sound deadening. The other thing that it could be attributed to is the different electrical packages that they get. So a lot of the factory wiring looms will be the same, but for example, the GT has foldable mirrors. The mirrors themselves might actually be different. The other thing that will make up a little bit of the weight difference is the wheels. The 4x4 3.2 litre XT comes with 255 70 16s, whereas the XTR and GT come with larger wheels. They have a 265 65 17. They also have a larger spare wheel, 17 by 7.5, so the rims are bigger. So that will account for some of the weight increase, but that wouldn't account for 69 kilos difference between the XT and the XTR. So the tires will make up some of it, and changes in the head unit and the audio system and stuff will make up some of it as well. But I feel like there is a chance that some of this does come down to improved sound deadening from factory, but I'll have no way of knowing without actually tearing one of these apart. My biggest worry is that I'll go through all this work, add all this weight, and then there'll be really minimal, maybe no benefits whatsoever. So that's why I've put this off for a long time. In the end, I decided to finally do it just because I wanted the best sound quality possible on long drives, not having to turn the radio up as loud. It will hopefully pay dividends in the long run, but we'll just wait and see how the test results go with the before and after testing. So a lot of people say good things about all this, but a lot of people do it in 79 series or patrols or really old sort of tinny cars. I uh, think the more modern dual cabs, you'll see less benefit, but hopefully we still see some benefit out of all the weight that we add in. So before we get into the install, we're just gonna have a look at the website. We'll just quickly run through a few of the different materials and try and clear things up. All right guys, so to have a better understanding of the different components of the kits and what each application is for, the best way to do it is just to look at the 
dual cab sound deadening packs. You don't have to buy in a pack. I bought my stuff separately because it actually worked out cheaper the way I did it. Basically packs one and two are the same, but two adds in a roof sheet. Three and four are the same, but four has a roof sheet. The differences between one, two and three, four is that one and two will use a waterproof carpet underlay as a stage two sound deadener and the three and four will use a mass noise liner. So stage one will be the same on both. They use sound deadener. So this is sound deadener. This is what they call stage one. And this is for getting rid of that resonance in panels. So mostly your doors and your roof will be the worst, but also your floor pan and your rear firewall. So this might not change the peak levels of volume in the car, but it should clean up the noise a little bit. You roll it on, has a peel off sticky back. Now this stuff is really easy to cut. A lot of the time you don't really have to measure it, you just sort of hold it up roughly where you want it. You want this contacting the metal surface, so you want to work it into any grooves so you have full contact across the board. Now this stuff, you don't need 100% coverage. Ideally you'd get about 70 to 75% coverage, will give you 95% effectiveness. Anything over 50% coverage is considered really good. You're looking at 50 to 75% coverage ideally. Now for stage two, which is your actual noise reduction, so tire noise, engine noise, road noise, other cars passing by. This is where these packs differ. You've got waterproof carpet underlay for one and two, and three and four use a mass noise liner. Waterproof carpet underlay is a closed cell foam. The mass noise liner is a really heavyweight sort of 10 mm foam with a two mil rubber glued to it. Now this foam acts as a decoupling layer. So the rubber is the insulator on top but the foam prevents the rubber from contacting the surface that it's isolating and this improves the sound quality. This is not sticky back, so you only use this on the floor pan. It is easy to cut, it is heavy, but it is a pain to work into corners and stuff like that. And if you overuse it, you will struggle to get your carpet back on. You have two mil mass loaded vinyl with 10 mil closed cell foam. And this is easily removable because it is not stuck down at all. If you remove all your carpet and trim again, you can take this out. The waterproof carpet underlay is for packs one and two. This is a closed cell foam. This is sticky back and this is a lot lighter weight. So if you're worried about weight, this will be lighter than the mass noise liner. This is mostly paired with four drive packs. Other packs for different cars, like your small cars, for example, they won't come with this waterproof carpet underlay. They'll use acoustic liner or for the premium mass noise liner again. So this is the acoustic liner. It does the same job as a waterproof carpet underlay. But the acoustic liner is given in these packs for the rear firewall. 10 mil foam, but this is open and closed cell foam. Lightweight, sticky back. This can be used in place of the waterproof carpet underlay if you want, but they do tend to pair this with the four wheel drives because they are exposed to water more frequently. Acoustic lining for your rear firewall. And you could also use this indoors. You could also use this on the roof if you have a large enough gap between the roof lining and the actual roof itself. But what they tend to do in packs two and four, which come with roof sheets, you will get insole layer. And this is basically the same thing, but it is thinner. So you got six mil and a three mil variant. It's lightweight, so good for hanging vertically, basically on your roof or in really small cavities where you're not gonna fit anything else in. And it's the same thing, sticky back. So that's basically all there is to it. Your stage one is the same for everything. It's sound deadener, it's a rubbery material, easy to cut, and it's for reducing vibrations. Reducing actual noise, you have mass noise liner is your premium product. Then you have a waterproof carpet underlay or an acoustic liner. Acoustic liner for the rear firewall, insole layer for the roof, now the acoustic liner, if you want to buy some extra, then you could also fill your door cavities with this. Then if you want, you can buy this mass noise liner joining kit. What this is, is a three meter roller tape, 75 mil wide, comes with a little bit of glue that they have found works with this type of rubber. And all it is, is the same two mil rubber that comes on your mass noise liner, except without the foam stuck to it. And you just use it to patch up relief cuts or butting up two different pieces of mass noise liner because you're always going to have cuts to make the folds flow more nicely similar to what they've got here and the glue is also handy if you want to use mass noise liner and check out the foam and just overlap two sheets so as we saw on the website sound deadener this is a rubbery sort of product that stops vibrations this is most effective on the roof and door which are your largest flat panels this is mass noise liner you can see it is a two mil rubber 
with Tamil closed cell foam glued to it. This is what gives us our soundproofing from the road noise. Or the alternative is that you use acoustic liner. I bought an extra roll for my doors, but it also comes included in the dual cab pack for your rear fireball. It's about 10 mil thick. For the roof, you get insulated layer, comes in a three mil and six mil variant. You could probably use acoustic liner for the roof. You see the difference in thickness between the two. This is used in areas where you don't have a lot of space. They are the four different products that I bought. Sound deadener basically goes everywhere. Mass noise liner on the floor, acoustic liner on the rear firewall, and I'll probably put it in the doors and the insulator layer goes on the roof. All right, just quickly on the seats, we lift this up to reveal a T50 Torx bit, take that out. We've got the same on the back, four in total per seat, drivers and passengers, each one has an airbag connector, 7mm socket, disconnect to that. Front trim, uh, this depends on what model car you got, but two trim removal tools in there, pop it towards the back. We've got to get these silver panels off to remove this center console with the glove box and the handbrake boot over the top of it. So just have a look around for all these Torx bits that are holding everything down. There's a couple down here holding the center console. Disconnect the SIG sockets. Um, more Torx bits here holding silver trim and just yeah keep working your way around until all these Torx bits are removed and then we can get that center console out. I've got to disconnect this SIG socket as well by lifting it. Rear seats, T50 Torx bit for that seat belt bolt. Uh, remove that plastic trim on the back, you've got T50 Torx bits and then the seats themselves that were screwed in there were just on these hinges. You just got to pull the whole seat up trim removal tool to pop those three buttons out and then down here you want to do another Torx bit T50 and then just move this seat belt out of the way that's just preventing the carpet coming out behind this visor you got some T20 Torx bits you just got to pop these clips open to get access to them these all hold up the roof liner um, these clips at the back, pull the center out. I'm not 100% sure how to get these out. I just kind of pulled them. I broke one. T20 again for that. Uh, the grab handle. These are T30. These are Torx bit again. And 6mm socket to get your handles out. And then this trim just pulls off. After that, you just got to work everything off. You'll have cables taped to the underside of the roof lining. So you need to break that off so you don't pull too much on the cables. Now these clips at the rear are a pain in the ass. So these coat hanger hooks, still not sure how you're meant to get them out properly because they clip in there. You remove the center bit. There's no tab on the inside where you would put a screwdriver through to pull these in to release it from the roof line. These are crap, I snapped one. All right guys, so I've taken the headliner off. I'm gonna start up here, just gonna clean everything with isopropyl alcohol, wax and grease remover, rags, paper towels, whatever you've got. I'm gonna stick sound deadener on. I'm only looking for about 70% coverage, but if it works out more than that, it doesn't really matter. You don't have to cover everything, but most people do anyway. Roof is a pain in the ass to get off. Well, it's pretty easy except the rear cone hangers. Now, the floor's ready to come out, but we'll just leave it in just so we've got something to kneel on, and then we'll put all the roof lining back in once we finish that, just so we've got less to deal with, less parts lying around, and then we can remove the floor and work on the floor. The roof liner itself has these small pieces of carpet, but we're gonna have that insulator layer in there. So whether they both fit or not, I'm not sure. Otherwise, we just rip these off. And you can see the roof. Luckily for me, it's actually quite clean. So there's not too much gunk to get off, but you can tell. You can see how long that reverb saw. So once you've cleaned it, all you really need is your roller, knife or scissors or whatever, if you want to cut it to shape. For this particular panel, I'm just going to go two sheets, and I'm not worried about 10, 20 more gaps on the sides. It's a non-issue, you're not going to get any benefit from filling them in. This one, the panels actually fit long ways, so I could probably get three sheets. So five sheets for the roof, and I won't have to make any cuts. Alright guys, I just want to show you with the roof, because it is the biggest flat panel, the difference that a little bit of coverage makes. Just so you can tell the difference already from when I was tapping it before. See how there's no resonance there? So already it's fine, 70 to 75% coverage will give you about 95% effectiveness. If you want to save weight on this stuff, then definitely 
just um, realise that you don't need too much because it's very effective at about 50% and this stuff does have a fair bit of weight to it, obviously that's what makes it effective. In reality I could leave it like that but I didn't set them up to do two, I set them up to do three, otherwise I would have moved them more to the centre. So I'm going to do three now. So the roof layer is done, the insulator. layer that's a 6mm variant. There is a 3mm variant as well. That covers more than the sound deadening and that's nice and lightweight, easy to stick to the roof but peeling the back off is a pain in the ass because it comes in a roll. It's not a flat sheet so it likes to tear. Now I'll stick the roof lining back on. I am leaving this on, just a little bit of extra insulation. I think there's plenty of room up here. Ready to take the floor out now. There was a clip here that we had to remove. Another one in here, same on the other side. In the footwell, go get rid of these. So I was worried about this. The factory spec, it already has a decent job at noise reduction. They've gone over the transmission tunnel and everything. I don't know if we're gonna see much benefits here, to be honest, but we'll take it off anyway. Um, I could extend it a little bit further into the footwell and I'll probably loop it up here as well, but not a bad job. For most people, I'd recommend probably not bothering. Let's see how we go. So this is all the factory stuff. So to get this out around these, I'm just gonna cut it. Right, now we've got the rear firewall and the floor as well. The rear firewall and the floor both have sound deadener applied, but where they differ is that the floor will have the mass noise liner. The rear firewall will get the acoustic liner. Just gave everything a quick vacuum. You can see it's got these. These are basically anti-vibration. To be honest, this car, it's quite a good job of it. I'm just gonna go over the top. I'm not looking for 100% coverage, um, but areas like in here need filling. And across the front here for the bench seat. Go straight over the top of this. I'm not gonna waste my time trying to pick it out. All the grommets are in good condition. And then when we get to the mass noise liner, this is the factory one. I'm gonna replace it with the aftermarket one. It's kind of hard. If you don't remove the dash, you can't tuck it in behind in one piece like they have, because they put it in before the dash goes in. The alternative obviously is I leave this in and don't put extra on, or I leave this in and just put another layer on top. Around here, I've actually got a lot of room around where the glove box sits, so I don't think that will be an issue. Along the rear firewall, gonna have sound deadener. All right, just a quick look at the sound deadening. The rear firewall, but we've still got the acoustic liner to put on there. I've just gone down into the seats. These were some of the worst areas at the back here. I haven't gone for 100% coverage. I've just gone for the majority and then tried to use up offcuts wherever possible. Same as this main floor pan here. There was already factory stuff here. In the footwell we have this heavy sort of foam. So I haven't gone any higher than that because that won't actually do anything if it's not on metal. So it's only on the floor pans. I've got a patch in here, patch in here, and then along the sides of this transmission tunnel. You see the factory stuff. There was already stuff in there. So again, whether we see many benefits from this, I'm not sure. We've added a fair bit of weight though, which is annoying if it doesn't work. So here I've got the roll of mass noise liner. And then this is the factory mass noise liner that came out of the car. The advantage of this stuff is that it's all cut in one piece because they put it in when the dash is out. I can reuse these. They operate on the same principle. There's a decoupling layer. So basically your insulation is not on the metal because otherwise it's not as effective and they use a wool sort of insulation here. The new one uses a foam. I'm not sure which one is better at soundproofing. It'll be really disappointing if I install the new stuff and it's not as good. But I guess at the end of the day, it wouldn't be too hard to put this back in. Even though it's not one piece anymore, it's still mostly one piece. Just a partial update. I didn't end up using the template. I just thought i will do it myself because the template has a lot of holes that I couldn't see any reason for them being so large. It's not perfect yet. I've done one sheet. It'll be less than one sheet on the other side. Then I'll have to tape it up. And then I'll try to do something along this bench and maybe even something going into here. But I'll see how I go with all the scrap bits. Just try to go through wherever possible. And then I'll tape it up to the one that comes on the other side. Final look before I put the trim on, or at least attempt to. So it does go further up the footwell than the original one did. On the back rear firewall, we have the acoustic liner over the top of the sound deadener. And then I've tried to put some mass noise liner down here and then cut it down so it drips in here. But I'm not sure if this carpet's gonna go on because I don't think 
there was as much clearance around here as there was on the main floor pan. The doors, I'm gonna run through how to take off all the trim and I'm just gonna show you the before and after. I've done the other side already. So we'll just see what it sounds like, what the differences are by tapping on this door and then tapping on the other door, that's already been done. This is the side that I have done. The passenger side of the car, I have not done yet. So we'll start with the easy stuff. Phillips head screwdriver in the door handle. Two Phillips head underneath. Now behind the handle, we have a plastic clip. So we remove this and we have this here, it's a Torx bit. So the speaker we pull off and we just remove the electrical connection. Pry this up as well and remove this electrical connection here. The last connection is the door handle. For the door handle, you just need to remove this portion. So around here, this is a door seal. It does tear quite easily, but it basically has a rubber seal that's supposed to be reusable. But depending on how old your car is, it might not be in the best condition. We just want to peel all this away, try not to tear it. That's it, front door. Now we have access to the front door. You can get to the outer skin. And that's the one that we want to be putting the sound deadener on. And in my case, after the sound deadener, I'll use acoustic liner over the top just because I've gone through the hassle of opening it up. So I may as well put some soundproofing as well as sound deadening on there. It does vibrate, big flat panel. There are different braces and things in there that might make it awkward to do one cut that covers the whole thing. So you might have to do it in different sections. For the sound deadener, it doesn't matter. With the acoustic liner, the bigger the cut you can get, the better. So we'll give it a clean. Isopropyl alcohol, wax and grease remover, paper towels. So the sound deadener is pretty easy to get in. It's quite easy to work around different corners and just want to roll that on so you've got good connection on the doors. Make sure you've cleaned everything. Measure up the different portions. You don't need full coverage. Just keep tapping on the outside of the door until you're happy with the resonance and then probably stop there because you're going to see minimal gains after that. Here's a quick look at what I've done. Uh, little off cuts, just use them up where you can, but it's mostly done in about three cuts. Now, measuring up for the acoustic liner, this is more awkward to feed in. The sticky back will stick to everything. So I recommend peeling off the sticky back, putting it back on, then feeding it up, and then that sticky back will come off a lot easier the second time because you've already peeled it off once. Roll it down just to avoid it blocking the windows from lowering. I've done tiny, about five mil overlaps here just to give the best soundproofing as possible. So the road noise coming through the doors is limited. Limited amount of space here. So I couldn't do one big sheet because it's too awkward to fit it in here, peel the sticky back off without it sticking to everything as you try and put it in. So 450 by 650, 450 by 650, and then a sheet, which was just the remaining, I don't know what that is, maybe 150 by 650. So the acoustic liner isn't an inclusion in the dual cab packs, but if you want to do that, you have to purchase things separately. Now with the extra cab door, it is pretty similar to seat belt bolts behind here in the grab handle and on the bottom. So with the extra cab, it is quite a large panel. Everything up here is all a void, but this is the only opening you have. Try and chuck some acoustic liner in, at least up to the window line. So just quickly, can't really see much, but acoustic liner basically comes over this sort of area here. Obviously this portion of the door is against here, so it's not as important. And this portion over here sits in between here. So also not as important, but we've just tried to get as much as we can. Got two cuts, one above this brace here, and one below. 
So everything is back together, but just some things to note. If you do like I did and you pack out this, your rear seats probably won't clip in anymore. It's not an issue if someone's sitting on them, they're not gonna go anywhere. These trims here, not clipping in properly, doesn't really bother me. To fix the issue, you will just need to lift the carpet and trim back a little bit of the mass noise liner, but this doesn't worry me at all. I'd rather have the mass noise liner covering more of the floor, but that's just something to keep an eye on. That's the same on the other side. And I think there was one clip in the footwell that might be missing, but that's all good. All right guys, so just finished up with the install and I've been weighing all the offcuts and rubbish just to be able to figure out exactly what I installed in the car, as well as figure out how many sheets of each different thing I used for an extra cab. And hopefully you'll be able to suss out how much you need from there. So with the sound deadener itself, I actually used 31 and a half sheets. Now you get 12 to a box. So to replicate that, you'd have to buy three boxes because 12, 24, 36 sheets, and you'd have about four and a half sheets left over. So with the sound deadener, we've added 17.199 kilos. Now with the mass noise liner, I've actually used two full sheets and then part of a third sheet. So to get the same thing, you'd have to order three sheets, obviously, which comes in at 334.99. And we've added 14.443 kilos in mass noise liner. So with the acoustic liner, I actually did the doors as well. So I ordered two sheets of acoustic liner. That was 1.851 kilos worth that I've actually installed for a total cost of 149.99. Now with the insole layer on the roof, I used a full sheet and then another part of a sheet. So that's two sheets worth. It only added 0.322 kilos to the car because it's nice and lightweight and that cost $94.99. So 188 grams was added with the mass noise liner joining tape. Didn't really use a lot of it, managed to get most of it done in one cut but it is definitely worth getting that to patch up all the relief cuts and stuff. Now I actually bought the application kit, which is $39.99, comes with a roller and a knife and L4 tape. Didn't use any L4 tape at all. Personally, you don't really see the point of it. So the total weight added, once you add all those up, is 34.003 kilos, but I've actually taken out the OEM mass noise liner. I did reuse bits of it, so this isn't the full weight of it, but the part that I removed was about 6.632 kilos and then I removed two plastic covers from the seat torx bolts can't see any reason for them being there it's just a waste of space so the total weight added to the car is 27.254 kilos so the cost of all of those added up is $940.94 now this worked out cheaper for me than going with the dual cab pack because the dual cab pack only has one sheet of acoustic liner but it comes with four boxes of sound deadener I had no need for four boxes of sound deadener because I'd rather have less sound deadener and less weight because you only need about 70% coverage, whereas they sort of provide enough to give 100% coverage for a dual cab. Extra cab's a bit shorter and I don't want 100% coverage, so three boxes was fine for me. So think about what you really need and then look at the cost of buying it separately compared to buying in packs. You might not need everything that they're supplying in the pack. I would recommend if you have a roller of some kind, just avoid the install kit completely. The knife is no use. I didn't use the L4 tape, so the roller is the only thing you need. You can buy that separately. Okay, so we're gonna have a look at the test results now. Now, what I've used is an app, and I've split the screen so you can see the app readings, as well as the current speedo on the ultra gauge. And in the text, I've just written a rough average from what I can see. This is not an average given by the app, it's just me Looking at the footage over that speed limit while the car was on cruise control, I've tried to pick out the average just from seeing what numbers are appearing on the screen. So there's a lot of ifs and buts and stuff to do with this, but I'll just play through the footage first at a few different speeds and you can compare them, see if you can notice any difference.
So you might have noticed that at 100 kilometers an hour in one direction, the first time we got to 100, it actually sounded quieter before the install. When we go 100 kilometers an hour in the other direction, it's completely flipped and it sounds a lot better post install. So these sort of little discrepancies do make it kind of hard to see what's going on. But anecdotally, I'd say that there is better sound reduction and the radio sounds a little bit better, as in I can hear it at lower volumes, but I don't consider it to be game changing at all. So it does get hard to analyze when we have a louder car post install in 100 kilometers in one direction, but a much quieter car post install at 100 kilometers in the other direction. So a few things to consider there. The first one is that obviously we have different driving conditions and you see at the end there, I've got the minimum, the average and the maximum for that session. But the average can be skewed because on one drive, for example, I was stopped at red lights longer. So that brings the average down. Whereas on the other drive, I was a bit lucky and I was driving more frequently, which brought the average up. So before I installed, we had a minimum of 61. Then it went to 60 after. The average was 74 for both. And the max was 87 before the install and 85 after. But these numbers don't really mean much because if you have a truck pass you by while you're waiting at the traffic lights, it can bump that maximum up to 87, for example. So I'll just play a shorter section of clips now, back to back at different speeds without the footage. So you can just turn the headphones up and listen to the differences, see if you can spot any differences in the sound quality. This is coming from the lav mic, which was set to the same volume each time. Should give a pretty good indication of the difference in sound quality. So from looking at the phone app and the averages given, the car is quieter at idle, quieter at 50 kilometers an hour, and it is quieter at 100. It tends to be about the same at about 70 and 80 kilometers an hour. There doesn't appear to be any difference, but from driving the car, it is a different sound. It doesn't block the engine noise. So I think the peak noises will still be the same, but the overall sound is a little bit cleaner. And it's worth noting that this changes massively on different driving conditions. I've done another test drive where I pressed the reset button while the car was on cruise control so that the phone app would give me the average. Unfortunately, I didn't do this before the install, so I don't have a great comparison. But in that test, for example, the car at 80 kilometers an hour was louder than the car was before the sound deadening went in. So the conditions that you're driving in can change it massively. Now I have noticed when I'm editing the video that the sound meters at the bottom of Final Cut Pro, they do tend to peak a little bit lower on the footage that's showing me after the install, which would indicate about a one to two decibel reduction in sound from the sound deadening if we use that as the metric. I think it is important to know that there is no proper control here. So there's not properly scientific test results. I've got different results in the car from doing 100 kilometers an hour, doing 80 kilometers an hour. The phone app will show that the car is louder at 80 kilometers an hour, even though when you compare the footage from 80 to 100, you can hear that it's louder at 100 kilometers an hour. It is more showing you the peak volume, 
doesn't really relate to all the white noise that surrounds it at different frequencies and that's a lot of the noise that's been tidied up a bit so it's kind of hard to get that across in a phone app. So let me know, could you guys tell the difference I can when I'm driving it, but in the footage, it doesn't come across that great. And I don't think the difference is massive anyway. I think there are minuscule differences, but the overarching pattern is about a one to two decibel reduction across the phone app. The recording does sound cleaner and Final Cut Pro does show the peaks appearing a little bit lower on the lavalier mic. Alright guys, that's it for this one. Just some quick notes and thoughts on the install. Uh, some things I did off camera, I actually added more acoustic liner behind that plastic trim on the rear firewall. And I did reuse the OEM mass noise liner, just a portion of it that goes up the transmission tunnel underneath the head unit because it is pre-cut to that shape and it gives me extra coverage that I couldn't quite get with the other mass noise liner coming in from the side. So if you're wondering whether it's worth it, I would actually say that for this particular style of car, I think it's more hassle than it's worth for all the weight increase and the cost. For about 80% of people, I wouldn't recommend it, but bear with me because there's lots of ifs and buts and caveats and conditions on this. So I'm just gonna expand on that a little bit, go through some of the average sound improvements that we see, some other scenarios where it might be worth it, and I'll just expand on why I don't think it's worth it. I'm talking about people with modern dual cabs with factory mass noise liner like I had, you can see here, it's all cut in one piece. It is covering the large majority of the floor and it also covers the transmission tunnel. So if you have a similar setup and once you lift your mass noise liner underneath, you have a decent amount of sound deadener like I do here. You can see it's quite a good coverage on the floor pan. Then if that's your scenario, I wouldn't recommend going through all this hassle. Now where this changes obviously is if you wanna get rid of that mass noise liner because you are worried about water ingress and you wanna to change to foam, then of course go through, rip it out, put the waterproof carpet underlay in if you're worried about weight. If not, go for the mass noise liner. So when it comes to the older style cars, Workmate Editions, uh, 79s, Patrols, all the early 2000 cars, then it's definitely worth it. It's definitely gonna make a massive difference. Now, if your car does have good mass noise liner and sound deadening from factory, you can always just do the doors and the roof without worrying about ripping all the interior trim out. We've seen that the sound deadener does work with the resonance before and after testing, but these benefits probably won't be felt on bitumen. That's the sort of stuff you'll notice more when it's raining for the roof, for example, or on gravel roads and corrugations where you're more likely to experience vibrations. The other scenario where it would be worth it is obviously if you're upgrading all your sound system and you want the best sound quality from upgraded subs and speakers, then adding sound deadening and acoustic liner in will reduce vibration and make the sound quality a lot better. So just because I don't recommend it, doesn't mean that it doesn't work. We've seen an average of about one to two decibels. It's not game changing. We know from test results that there is a change and I can notice it when I'm driving it, but nobody's gonna get in the car and think that I can't believe this car is so quiet. It doesn't dramatically change the sound of the car, but there are slight improvements. There's less white noise and the peaks drop a little bit and that's not linear across the board, depending on the gear and the revs. At idle, sometimes it's three to four decibels quieter. At 100, it might be about two to three decibels. Between 70 to 100, you only get about one decibel difference. If not, it's exactly the same as before, although with a little bit less road noise and white noise. I just don't think it's worth adding 30 kilos to your car, spending about $1,000 and probably 12 to 15 hours installing it. So that's why I say for most people it's not worth it because you're adding a lot of weight for a difference that is not quite perceptible. So with sound energy we have double the sound energy for three decibel changes but it's only just noticeable to the human ear. The way that we perceive noise takes about three decibels for the human ear to notice. Even though a three decibel change is double the sound energy it is barely noticeable to the human ear and that's the kind of range that we're sitting in for this type of car. With the older style cars, I'd expect to see between five and 10 decibels. So in that instance, it would definitely be worth it. So although we have reduced the sound energy, it is a bit easier to hear the quieter noises in the songs. But the way that we perceive noise, the human ear, you need a 10 decibel change to feel like you're listening to half the noise that you were before. So with that two decibel average change that we've got here, 
we are on the barely perceptible range. If someone jumped in the car, they wouldn't notice, they wouldn't think this car is any quieter than normal. I can tell the difference, but only slightly. It does sound cleaner and it is easier to hear the quieter parts of music. It is a lot quieter at low speeds, it's quieter at 100, but it's not game changing. For most people, it's not worth 30 kilos, a thousand bucks and a lot of hours in doing the work. It'd be even more expensive if you paid someone else to do it. So I'm glad that I can tell the difference. I'm glad that the car does sound quieter. So if you're not crazy about the music quality or you're not worried about water ingress, and I wouldn't recommend you go through all this hassle and spend all this money on this modification. But if you really want the best sound quality, then we see from the test results that it does work. There are improvements. They're just not massive in this particular style of car. So at the end of the day, it's up to you how much time and money you wanna spend on your car how much weight you want to add to it but it's important to know that you will see some benefit it just might not be as much as you were hoping for Pew -pew. fucking useless in reality I could leave it like that but in reality okay so this is the stock test before sound detonating and then tapping on the other saw oh, we, so I definitely remember definitely re and uh, it is or on gravel roads and coal the other